Delia Derbyshire had a better, though, not perfect look with her tenure at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. After returning from Switzerland, she got a job with the corporation as, uh, as a studio manager. And through a combination of excellence at her job and sheer insistence, dogged insistence, she secured uh, an unknown of indefinite secondment to the Radiophonic Workshop. Um, the way that Delia Derbyshire dealt with sound was that of a mathematician. Um, she'd analyse sounds and studiously note down the frequencies that made up the sound form, of the waveform rather. She did this through a clever bit of maths I don't really understand called the full Fourier transform or analysis. Um, what this does is allows the scientists to break down the complex individual waveforms that go to make an overall sound, the constituent sine waves. So Delia would analyse the sound of objects she found, uh, she found that she felt were appealing. Uh, there was a famous BBC lampshade which she felt to have the most pleasing resonance and used reconstructed numerous times in various pieces that she did. Uh, she pieced together melodies made of intricate sequences and combinations of test tones. She used the sampler's arsenal of looping, pitch modulation, reverse and echo that had been pioneered in Germany and France. But she never lost sight of the musicality of her pieces. They were structured often to themes composed by others. Now, it'd be remiss here not to speak for a minute on the theme to Doctor Who. Uh, she was robbed of a writing credit uh, that could and should have provided for her very well financially, but BBC rules dictated that as a technician, she would receive no credit. When he heard a realisation of the of the piece of music, Ron Granger, who ostensibly was the the composer, asked, "Did I did I write that?" Uh, to which Derbyshire replied, "Most of it." The theme was wildly influential, not just in the daydreams of school kids, uh, but amongst musicians as well. Um, one one aspect I thought of is I think there was a big possibility that Brian Wilson heard this maybe when he was in Britain in autumn of 1966 the dates apparently line up and uh, I, th I think it influenced that uh, that part I think that influenced him greatly for the uh, uh, for good vibrations uh, he of course used a theremin player um, or I'm not sure what it is it's very similar to a theremin and uh, but Delia was operating at a completely different level of his time she was using an oscillator by hand to play the melody um, it's not too far away from what we have in our digital audio workstations today she was almost sampling things and then looping them up the big difference being here is she was doing it the first time. A lot of the time she was reinventing the wheel or just plain inventing the wheel. One of the things that she'd do is break down a track to its, uh, into counterpoints for, say, four voices. Counterpoints, the idea of having different instruments or voices doing their own thing but all contributing to the, the composition. An example would be how in jazz walking bass plays against the lead instruments while the, the pianist picks out parts of the melody and the harmony um, probably the most famous example of counterpoint is the work of Dealey Dabsha's Delivered Bark having analysed the melody she, and maybe changed some of its contours she then rebuilt the harmony together from pieces of tape they might be the same piece of tape speeded up or slowed down they might be 
different objects or instruments slowed down and speeded up to get to pitch. She would get take one of these intricately butchered t pieces of tape for each voice of the counterpoint and play them back through a mixer at the same time. She ended up with results that at times sound uncannily like the early samplers of 20 years later. Um, the Radiophonic Workshop allowed Delia Derbyshire to perfect her tape editing techniques as well as gave her hands-on experience with all kinds of noise-making machines like the Wobblator. In essence, the Wobblator's two or more test generators, test oscillators, um, plugged into each other. One acts as the audible oscillator and the other is an LFO. By modulating the frequency of the audible one with the LFO and slamming the whole lot through reverb and echo, uh, you can make all kinds of laser, transport, whatever sounds. And um, this is a lot of what the, uh, the, the radiophonic workshop were doing. Uh, the, the sounds generated by the radiophonic workshop were uh, a kind of a gateway for the generation that came of age's acceptance of crazy sounds. I'd make a case that were there no Quatermass uh, or Doctor Who, there'd have been no Hawkwind for one. But I still think we'd have had Motorhead. It quite definitely, inevitably. Um, her work found the ear of a Beatle who kind of had the most avant-garde taste at that time, Paul McCartney. He toyed with the idea of a radiophonic backing for the song Yesterday. I'm not sure if anything ever actually got made, um, but I think it's a real pity we don't get to hear that. Anyway, um, he was around those kind of circles. In, in 1966, she and one of her ra radiophonic colleagues, Brian Hodgson, formed the creative partnership that was to be at the centre of an electric storm. Um, with the composer and electronics engineer, Peter Zivinyov, Zinoviev, sorry, uh, they formed Unit Delta Plus. Today they'd probably be a laptop band. Um, they used electronic devices like oscillators and early synths, previously prepared tapes and live feedback systems of echo. It had been perfect to play at UFO or Middle Earth, the big hippie clubs of the time. Um, I'm sure the assembled heads would have absolutely freaked out and they'd have had their minds blown by this proto hawk wind without the rock elements. But, as it was, they gave more academic demonstrations in the hinterland between academia and the avant-garde. Uh, Peter Zinovriev, need to get that right, the member of Unit Delta Plus who didn't go on to contribute musically to the, to the White Noise projects, still went on to be important to its realization. Uh, Zinoviev came from Russian aristocratic stock, definitely old money. He was a composer of avant-garde electronic music himself, married to a fellow aristocrat who was richer than him. So he had both the time, the inclination and the money uh, to make his creations. His company AMS were going to create the VCS3. Uh, that science fiction box of electronics so beloved of, well, Hawkwind again, Brian Eno, and probably most famously, it's all over Dark Side of the Moon, on the run being almost 100% VCS3. Um, Maka performed on the same bill as Unit Delta Plus. He was, as I said, he was orbiting in a lot of the same circles at this time. It was at this performance for Carnival of Light, the famous lost Beatle recording that Mackey himself has kept a close grip on, got its only airing. Um, that performance which might better be called a demonstration or even art action was a young music student called David Vorhaus.
He was the, the son of a film director with communist tendencies who'd been pinpointed by the McCarthy trials and on the run since. And like Delia Derbyshire, David Vohaus was highly educated. He, was, uh, he had an, a degree in, I think, physics and music. He played the double bass. Um, he was handy with a soldering iron as well, so he could make some of the things that needed, that both Dealey Derbyshire and Brian Hodgson decided that they needed to perfect their vision. Zinoviev uh, split from the group over creative differences and a note here, he was the first person in the world to own a home computer or perhaps to be more accurate a computer in his home or rather to be even more accurate the shed that had been the home to Unit Delta Plus's uh, makeshift sound lab. In a Red Bull interview he says about wanting to get rid of the need to splice tape which he saw as a waste of good composing time. His computer was to be used as a sequencer, uh, telling oscillators when to sound and what pitch uh, to, to operate at. Anyway, after the split, they met with Vorhaus by chance. He, he recalled their name from the night he'd attended um, the, the, the concert. He'd been, he'd been so innovated at the time by the possibilities that Unit Delta Plus afforded that he'd completely passed him by that uh, one Paul McCartney had been on stage doing his thing as well on the same bill. He only remembered some other guy. Uh, a fact which amused and no doubt flattered Delia Derbyshire and Brian Hodgson. Um, Forhouse comments that she was his girlfriend and taught him everything about electronic music. I can find no reference to Delia Derbyshire saying that David Vorhaus was her boyfriend. Maybe he means platonically. Maybe he... Maybe that's just how things were in the 60s. Um, in any case, she herself says nothing about this being. And to be honest, I can't remember that... Uh, I, I, remember, I can't imagine there being much time for romance over all the soldering irons and tape splicing. So, soon after they met, uh, they recorded a single surreptitiously using the BBC studios at night. These two tracks were Love Without Sound and Your Hidden Dreams. Um, they shopped this single around. Uh, Decker, who turned down the Beatles and now suffered from severe FOMO over anything freaky, offered to release it. Doubtless, no one at Decca had a clue that just a few years earlier they turned down one of the main creators on this project for a job. And on that note, um, okay, so that's the end of the second episode. And uh, so we're taking this up until the actual recording of the album. In the next one, I'm going to be doing a track by track kind of walk through on the album. There's two very different sides to it. If, as if you've heard it, you will know already. Um, as always, if you like this kind of content, please do remember to like, subscribe and share. Um, and thank you very much. See you very soon for the next episode. Goodbye.